appreciate all of you coming here. My name is Robert McLean. I'm by training a British historian. So um, when I was introduced as an expert, I was kind of like, oh no. Uh, but um, I do have a very good background in foreign policy and I have a good background in modern European history. I regularly teach modern Britain. I teach early modern Britain, which is fun because it's like Game of Thrones. Yeah. And then I teach World War II as well, which many of the places you hear in the news right now, these are the same places that were fought over heavily in World War II. And because many of you are coming from a high school background, I think it's, a, what I wanna do is give you the context of this, why it's happening, what's happening, what a potential outcome might be uh, within the European context. So um, some of you might wonder why Mr. Putin would initiate a war in Ukraine. And this is really, there was a war in the early 1990s in what used to be Yugoslavia when the communist bloc collapsed. Now, when the communist bloc collapsed, when the Cold War ended in the early 1990s, the other thing that happened was the Soviet Union, Russia and its territories broke up into a number of different countries. One of those countries was Ukraine. Ukraine is, the, the, except for Russia, the largest country in Europe. It has about 44 million people. So it's a sizable country. And its history with Russia has always been very complicated. Uh, one thing that you will hear Mr. Putin say is that there is no such thing as Ukraine. They're really Russians, but they don't know it. Now, I'll say more about that. But when, when the Soviet Union, with Russia as a core, came apart in the early 1990s, Mr. Putin was a KGB officer, the equivalent of our CIA. He was a middle-level KGB officer. And now he's the richest, one of the richest men in the world who's amassed billions of dollars. So you might ask yourself how... I'm not gonna answer it, but you might ask yourself how a guy who's making the equivalent of 50 bucks a month as a KGB officer goes on to become a billionaire, and it's not through honesty. I can tell you that. But there's a lot of nostalgia among some Russians for the, for the communist period. And you're thinking, why are they nostalgic for it? They're not nostalgic for it because they miss communism. They're nostalgic for it because they see it as a period when Russia was extremely powerful, when they were, and they were stable. You know, that they, they were stable. Despite the fact that they lived under an oppressive system, they kind of have a nostalgia for that stability. And so in Vladimir Putin's mind, the greatest tragedy in Russian history is that the Soviet Union came apart in the early 1990s. To him, that's the greatest, greatest tragedy that they have. Now, the other aspect of this is that he, like um, a lot of people, um, see everything through the lens of World War II, from, you know, which lasted in Europe from 1939 to 1945. Are there any of you who like to watch like, World War II films or study the history? A number of you. So let's frame this for you. Now, you're used to seeing an American version of World War II history. And, you know, Saving Private Ryan comes on the movie channel. You watch Saving Private Ryan. And the Americans won the war. But let me tell you the other side of it that Russians remember. Russians remember a war that was fought largely on their territory in which huge numbers of people died. So let me make a comparison here. About 400,000 American soldiers died in combat and in accidents and of disease during World War II. If we take Russia or Soviet, including Ukrainians at that time, civilians, if we take civilians and military, does anybody want to take just a wild guess at how many people died? Hey, hang on, what's it? Wait, wait, high we school kids first. <laughs> Anybody? Yes, sir. Uh, 10 million? 
That's, you know what? Okay, let me get some more guesses. 69 million. <laughs> 20 million. You're in the neighborhood. 25 million. Now that's, that's okay, so, but even those high numbers aren't really out of the realm of, I mean, if you, somebody said 50 million, I'd be like, yeah. Yeah, because it's probably, it's, it's a matter of debate, but it's probably about 27 million people. And so for Russia, everything is the war. The war was yesterday in Russia. And Mr. Putin's parents survived the siege of Leningrad, now called St. Petersburg. And many of his family, much of his family died in that war. So his father was wounded fighting the Nazis. And so you'll notice he, his justification for the war was that the Ukrainians were Nazis because he knows ordinary Russian people will be like, oh, Nazis, yeah. because of what World War II did to them. So if you were to look at their war versus our war in World War II, it's vastly different. So if you did the averages, Germany and uh, Russia went to war on June 22nd of 1941. Germany surrendered on May 8th of 1945 with American and British troops about 80 miles from Berlin while the Russians were literally assaulting Hitler's bunker in May of 1945 and then Hitler committed suicide. If you look at the averages, somewhere on the average is that 21,000 Soviet soldiers and citizens die per day. 21,000 per day. And so every month, they lost as many people killed as the Americans did in the entire war. Every month. And so everything, his worldview is framed through that. What does he want? He wants a reunited Russian empire. He wants security. He wants energy. 80% of Ukraine, this area right here, is full of energy. 80% of Ukraine's coal, 80% of Ukraine's natural or gas is in that region. Mr. Putin knows that Russia cannot match the United States, Germany, and France from an industrial perspective, or in terms of energy, or in terms of military. But he can control energy and use it to blackmail other people and he can use it to buy off the other oligarchs in Russia, and he can use it to buy off the Russian people. There's kind of an implied contract in Russia for the Russian people. We'll tolerate your corruption, but you have to guarantee stability and prosperity for the ordinary Russian. There's a wink and a nod there, because if you criticize Putin, you're going to jail or you're going to die. Over almost nearly 60 journalists have been murdered under mysterious circumstances since he came to power in the early 2000s. So you have to look at this through the lens of World War II. This is why what you're, you know, many of you are learning in Shane Beck's class is so important because he shows you the trajectory of these things, right? The why these things are happening. And so those are, uh, I think that's a very, two very important things to remember. Um, the other thing is, after the war ended, you know, the United States was a superpower. The United States, along with Great Britain, and m most of Europe, established a couple of things that were supposed to guarantee peace. One was the United Nations, where they would debate and try to come to peaceful solutions for problems. The other thing was the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. This was an outcome of World War II, and, a, and it, it was an alliance, and it is an alliance to, um, it was established really as a counterbalance to the Soviet Union and the communist Eastern Bloc, which encompassed, the Soviets encompassed Poland, East Germany, Romania, Hungary, um, Yugoslavia, uh, that became the communist bloc. NATO was meant to balance that. NATO was still in place. NATO 
if this war expands, it will be through NATO, but through NATO means to a significant extent, the United States and Great Britain. And then some of you should be worried because you're close to military age. Uh, that should concern you. That should concern you. Because if there were a general European war like in World War II, there are now nuclear weapons. Do you know how long it takes a, uh, an intercontinental ballistic missile to get from the, the Russian Arctic to Los Angeles? Oh, I forgot, we have a guy who used to launch nuclear missiles. No, here. no, no, I just maintained them. <laughs> you just maintained them. You just maintained. How long would that take? 30 minutes. 30 minutes. And if they aimed at the Fullerton Public Library, <laughs> God forbid, because you know, libraries are high priority targets. Do you know how close it would get? 100 meters? For the Russians, I'm not sure. The U.S. the Minuteman Close enough. To... Close enough. It's close enough. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say, yeah. A, a U.S. rocket would get what? If we about 50 meters. 50 from meters here. from here to the other side of the parking lot. But I'm guessing you don't have to be that close with a nuclear. <laughs> My colleague says, right? Close enough. I think it's close enough. Horseshoes and hand grenades, close enough, and not and, and nuclear weapons. So this should be something that you follow very closely. This is the most significant war in Europe since 19, the 1940s. And large numbers of people are dying. Now the other issue is, can Ukraine win? Possibly. Because with the help of Great Britain and the United States and France and Germany, we've given them technologically advanced weapons, but there's some other ones they want. The Russians could still win just by numbers and force and power. So they could win. Now, I will say that the Ukrainians are much more motivated. The average Russian soldier right now does not, most of them, not all of them, but most of them do not want to be part of this. Mr. Putin announced a mobilization of 300,000 young people, people barely older than you guys, and they do not want to go. So they're fleeing to other countries into uh, they're trying to get into, well, Finland. Finland to the north. It's not on the map. Mongolia. Mongolia and the far east, you know, Asian section of, um, of Russia. Uh, the Republic of Georgia, Turkey. You don't see, you don't have to have a visa to go from Russia to Turkey. Um, and so they're trying to cross the borders there. And the, the minute he announced that flights to Turkey and Armenia sold out. There was a 10 mile long of cars at the border with the Republic of Georgia of young people trying to, young men trying um, to get out. Can I, will you zoom this way so we can look at the map so uh, that well, they can see, cause I'm presuming that they don't know where Georgia is. We'll and it's see, not yeah. like Georgia, I guess, Georgia. 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 If you can, if you can make it. There we go. Yeah. And so you can see, right, a lot of them were fleeing across here, which was uh, Russia seized territory from them in 2008. They annexed Crimea in 2014. So this is part of a pattern of Russian expansion in which Mr. Putin wants to expand that empire, in which the, uh, the Western, I guess you could say the Western powers of the United States, Britain, France, and Germany are really trying to keep him from doing that. And so... That's the historical context of this right now. Now, what makes it even more interesting, does anybody know what Mr. Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, did before? He was a comedian. He was a comedian, and he was on the Ukrainian version of Dancing with the Stars. And then he got elected president. <laughs> when he got elected president, well, I said because he played one on the show. Yeah, he also had a TV show where he played a comedian who became president. Yeah. yeah, he had a TV show in Ukraine where he played a comedian who became president of Ukraine, and then he was a comedian who became president of Ukraine. And so Mr. Putin thought he was just going to roll over and give up, and he decided to stand and fight, and that totally changed the game. Now, you'll, another thing that you'll hear Mr. Putin say is that the Ukrainians are really Russians, that, you know, they just lost their Russian identity because, you know, the languages are close, right? You know, most Ukrainians speak Russian. 
most Russians do not speak Ukrainian. Though. The languages, if you look at them, um, they're about 50 to 60 percent similar, which is about the same as Dutch and English. So it's, they're really not necessarily that similar. And then you, if you ask many Ukrainians, hey, do you, are you Ukrainian or are you secretly Russian? Do you feel a little Russian? They're not going to say, yeah, I feel a little Russian, especially now. So national identity of Ukraine has actually been made stronger by this war. And they're fighting in a way that demonstrates that. And they're just much more motivated. I think I'm going to stop there okay. and let my colleagues speak. And then you guys can have questions. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of it. This is a huge topic. There's huge implications. But what I wanted to do was give you this historical background so you can understand it. Now, oh, one last thing. Yep. The weather began to change in Ukraine today. Weather is crucial in this part of, in, in Ukraine and Russia, because what happens, say, October, November, December, what happens in Russia? It gets a little chilly. It gets a little chilly. It just gets a wee bit chilly. You know, for example, when the Nazis attacked, uh, the so invaded the Soviet Union in 1941, uh, their first defeat came in December because partly because they were they weren't ready for winter. It was 19 degrees below zero at that time, and so your weapons freeze. The oil in your vehicle freezes. You freeze. Mm -hmm. You know you can find pictures of German soldiers frozen like popsicles, where they were just sitting down to do something and then kind of froze. They just froze in place. So the cold weather is coming, right? But what's going to happen first is you'll have a rainy season and nothing can move. It's just mud, 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 and more mud. And so the Ukrainians have been trying to make a last push to capture a couple of these key cities in that, down this, in this area before the, before the bad weather comes. And the bad weather probably started today. So most likely not much will happen until next summer when things dry out again. They call this time of the year the Rasputitsa, the time without roads because it just turns to pure mud and you can't move. So I'm gonna stop there. If you have any questions, save them and then I'll, uh, we'll address them in the question and answer session. I'm sorry, I went on so long. Um, um, can you do me a favor? Is there a way to zoom out instead of in? So it's like more, so we can see this like in relation to Turkey and the Middle East. Turkey and the Middle East. Yeah, maybe in a little bit. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, I think so this kind of helps us because I'm gonna talk about location, but um, it's this Georgia. We have Georgia too. <laughs> Not yet. That would be really scary. Um, okay, so my name is Dr. Burlingham, and I teach at Cal State Fullerton, the U.S. and the oh, sorry, let's switch. Um, I teach um, classes at Cal State Fullerton related to what we call now U.S. in the world, which used to be called diplomatic history. Um, uh, and so I'm going to, I, I teach a lot of other stuff too, but I'm an imposter in this oh. thing. But uh, I'm going to talk to you, I'm sort of taking the U.S. angle of this and sort of explaining U.S. strategic interests and why the U.S. is involved and why we're giving so much money and arms and the rest of it to Ukraine. And I'll elaborate some more on what Dr. McLean said. Um, <clears throat> but seeing where Ukraine is is, I think, like speaks to what you were speaking about, but um, just in terms of like its location. And, you know, one day you might decide to go backpacking for my high school friends and for people who are grown ups and did this before, but like these are places you might have gone to, right? And they're really close. So I think it's important to realize that like, Ukraine is not some distant place, it's very central. Um, so I kind of framed my questions around why does the U.S. care? That was the general question that I tried to ask. 
And I'm going to just hit some key points. Again, like as Dr. McLean said, this is such an enormous topic. It's very difficult to know where to actually begin because there are so many different angles to get at this. Um, one thing that I would just add to what Dr. McLean said in terms of like the mind of Putin, which I don't think either of us want to even begin to try and think about what's going on in the mind of Putin, because that would be a scary place to go. But um, there's the Soviet Union and the, 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 cons the, about the, you know, the concerns about the fall of the USSR and stability and the rest of it. But there's a lot of, um, Putin's an interesting fellow, and he has, um, there's a whole other side to him that's also about like the re return of the Russian Empire, which you had mentioned. And then we go really back in time, right? And I'm gonna leave that part to you. But um, you know, there's a lot of, one of the things that people point to, I've listened to like US diplomats talk about this, that the room where Putin meets US diplomats is, you might have seen memes about this because he met the French um, president in this, there's a very long table. And in that room are, are not the uh, statues of you know, Lenin and Stalin and other people, it's statues of former czars. And he likes to present himself as the, the latest czar. So it is about returning to the glories of the Soviet Union, but it's really also about returning to the glories of the Russian Empire. And in some ways that's even scarier because then that really extends, you know, into, if we're gonna talk about like the First World War, right? It extends further into this area. So if he sees himself as the restorer of the Russian Empire, um, that opens up a whole nother set of questions in terms of like, what is the end game here? Um, so I think people are paying a lot of money to try and figure out what the end game is. So we're not gonna learn that today. <laughs> Um, so why does the U.S. care? Like, why do we care about this fighting over here? We have enough issues, problems in the United States that we have to deal with that feel very present and in our lives every day. And um, I want you guys to keep in mind that, first of all, the U.S. exists in the world, even though sometimes people might try and deny that or ignore it. Um, and also that... Um, you know, at the base of U.S. foreign policy is the protection of the U.S., okay, which can make decisions by the United States government to do different things very confusing because it might feel like the United States is not making the decision that feels right or just, but it is the determination by those who are in power at that time that it is the thing that is most in the interest of the United States at that time. And that is subjective. Right? And it's also based on the evidence, the intelligence that the United States and decision makers have at that moment. Okay, So keep that in mind as we think about why we are so interested in making sure that Putin does not get this swath or any other swath of the Ukraine. Um, so some of these are about strategic concerns. Um, Dr. McLean already mentioned this idea of, about NATO. So NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, started out, you know, very much in on sort of like this side of Europe, right? Um, but once the Cold War ended, it started to creep over here because although NATO is a North Atlantic Treaty Organization, is a military alliance, it is not an economic alliance it nonetheless comes with some strings attached as being in the right club, okay? And those in power in Russia who have come, you know, post Gorbachev, essentially a few people who have been in power since Gorbachev, um, so after the fall of the Soviet Union, have always taken issue with the fact that NATO wasn't dissolved after the end of the Cold War. Because the purpose of NATO was, in its stated purpose, to be a, uh, a bulkhead against the Russians or the Soviets. So why does it exist? That's the argument. Why does it continue to exist if the Soviet Union is no longer a threat? So you will hear people say, well, the United, or people who are pro-Putin, the United States brought this on because 
NATO should have been dissolved, and they pushed Putin into a corner because Ukraine, which again is right on the border with Russia, was interested in joining NATO. Okay, so that felt provocative. So that, that's a little bit of a diversion. But so Ukraine is important because of its strategic location vis-a-vis -vis NATO. And what Dr. McLean was saying, I 100% agree with, which is when this starts to get scary, is if this tiptoes into NATO territory. And NATO territory surrounds Ukraine. Now, I'm probably going to get some of this wrong, so you're going to have to help me. But Turkey, Romania, Poland, not Belarus, not Belarus. Hungary, not Hungary. But they are e they, they They're are EU. EU. But EU has some defense issues with it, but it's primarily economic. But in any event, so you can see that these borders, so even if Kiev's here, and here's Poland, right? This is where there was some bombing going on, right on the edge. So this brings me to another point, which is part of this strategic concerns and also sort of the scary part of it, is who gets to decide what counts as a declaration of war? So if we are on, so let's, I'm gonna pause that, but let's think about that question. Who gets to decide what, what a declaration of war is? So does getting involved in someone else's business against another person as a proxy war count as getting, as a declaration of war? Because Russians could decide that, should they choose. So strategic reasons, NATO, EU, we have an alliance here, and frankly, I don't think anyone's interested in a world war, but if Putin were to put one toe into Poland, we are contractually obligated to respond. And he has put his pinky very close to the border with Poland, like within miles. They've actually flown jets over Poland. They've been flying jets where they cross the Polish border. So if that's Polish airspace, does that count as an invasion into NATO? So you can see how this gets real sticky, right? Okay, also strategic. Um, also related, if you can, can you just scan this up a little bit? Zoom in? No, not zoom, like if it moves up. I'm curious about these places down here. Yep, up, up, up. Ah, that's good. Okay, so that's the bottom, right? This is the Black Sea. And here we have Turkey, NATO country. But we also have the Middle East here. And Iran over here, Iraq, Syria, Egypt. Um, this is strategically important too. And so the location of Ukraine between Europe and between the Middle East is just I mean, I don't, I think even for those of us who don't know a lot about these parts of the world, like I think you can intuit that this is a, it's very strategically located. So I think Putin knew what he was doing. I mean, Ukraine has a very long history of Russians invading too. So he's just the latest version of people invading. Um, the other strategic issue has to do with the ports. Okay, I'm gonna make you, sorry, I'm making you work. Can you come back down? So this is a Black Sea. So these are these strategic ports which lead out, how would it go? Into the Mediterranean, right? The shipping lines go this way? Um, they go, yeah, through. Through Istanbul. Straits of Bosporus. Yeah. And out to the Mediterranean and then through, right, out into the ocean and into Africa and around over here. So this is North Africa. And a lot of energy comes through. <clears throat> This region too. Yeah, so you have pipelines, and we'll talk about pipelines, but you have energy pipelines coming out, bringing the energy out, but you also have, have, you know, Ukraine is blessed. This is like a typical problem, right? They're, they're too good, right? They have lots of energy, but they also are the breadbasket of much of the world. So there's a huge global insecurity crisis right now because most of the world's emergency green. So we're talking about like when the UN or the US are shipping um, grain to the poorest people in the world who need emergency food. It comes from Ukraine. 
And right now, the Russians control the port city from where the grain is being shipped out of. Number one, they also control the waters around it and they've mined all the waters. And number three, they've also mined all the farms where much of the grain is grown. And because of war, people haven't been able to plant. Okay, so strategically, there's the location, but there's also all of the chaos that is done just by this one place in terms of global food insecurity and energy, um, which we'll get to. Um, okay, so strategic reasons, there's several. Precedence, this is again, remember I'm, I'm answering the question, why does the US care? Keeping in mind that US is always working in the US interest at the end of the day. If you're sitting down at a security council, well, it would be security council. If you're sitting down uh, with the president and you have to make a big choice, you, you ultimately have to refer back to what is best for the United States because that's who they're working for, right? They're working for us. We talk about precedents. So there's different kinds of precedents. One would be the invasion of a sovereign, an unprovoked invasion by, of a sovereign nation by another sovereign nation, sovereign being free nation. And in this case, in Ukraine, a democratic sovereign nation. And that is a precedent that global leaders can't tolerate because the eyes of the world are looking on this situation and thinking, you know, if the global community allows this to happen, what can be, um, what can we get away with in other places, right? So the eyes of the world are looking at how the global community deals with this situation because this isn't Putin's first dance in Ukraine. In 2000, I think it was on 2014, 14. he took, he also invaded and took over a piece of Ukraine here, it's here, right? Mm -hmm. um, and nobody did anything. They let him have it. And we all went on with our lives. But it set precedent, right, of what, that you could get away with certain things. Now, there's a certain other country that the United States is not interested in them learning, and in, in feeling like the US will sit aside while one sovereign nation is uh, taken over by another nation. Does anyone know what that is? Taiwan. Yeah, so Taiwan. So if so China, so Taiwan is a sovereign nation. The United States recognizes it as a sovereign nation. It's a long history about what that is. China recognizes it as a part of China. But the Chinese have been very provocative in their language, but also in their ships and in their jets, sort of threatening the sovereignty of Taiwan. So the United States as a superpower has the unfortunate, fortunate obligation to be a, a power that is gonna try, that is gonna think this way in terms of like what is the precedent. We can't allow these things to happen in terms of taking over. And China, the China-Taiwan relationship is very much part of that. Um, also precedent. Putin's a known enemy to the United States, a known entity, also probably an enemy as well. Um, and so the United States knows, and the world community know what he's capable of, which is scary, things that he's capable of. Um, and he has a long history of doing pretty nasty things. For a long time, he was involved in some scary stuff in Chechnya, which was another war that happened in the 2000s, early 2000. But also, the Russians were very much involved in Syria, which is down here, and a lot of um, sort of genocidal activity, um, targeting of civilians. And that, I, I heard some people talk about Syria and Russian involvement in Syria as like the testing ground for what he's now doing in occupied areas of Ukraine. And it's scary stuff. Like, I don't think we need to sit here and do all about that, but it's, it's bad. And so he, so, the United States doesn't always act 
doing the moral thing is not necessarily strategically the right thing, unfortunately. Um, and so that's a balance that has to be walked, but, but it can't be ignored. Um, and then I would say also the president's lessons learned from the Second World War in terms of appeasement and Hitler and sort of thinking like, if we let them go, you, like you can just have this, but please stop. Like, I'm not sure that works with this crowd. Um, and then finally, geopolitical concerns. So um, world power, it's very difficult to govern in a chaotic world. So the United States likes uh, and other countries like um, a not chaotic world. And Putin knows that. So it's strategically important for the United States to try and facilitate what it can in order to maintain um, a non-revolutionary environment in which the United States has to live, unless we have to live geopolitically. So. Um, in our history, this has resulted in us putting people in power in places that we knew we could depend on because they would bring, they would put down what we perceived to be the chaos. Often that was, you know, involved killing a lot of people and supporting right-wing dictatorships, but it brought the stability that the United States and other places needed in order to govern. It's very hard to govern in chaos. Ask your parents what it's like when your house is chaotic and if they can govern you, the answer is no, okay? So that's not that different than the United States. What, happen, what happens when, I mean, the situation in Ukraine, I mean, I think we probably all are feeling this, your parents are probably feeling this, especially too. Um, what has gone up significantly in price since Ukraine yes, was invaded? Yes. yes, yes, thank you. We know about that in Southern California, right? So that creates instability. We feel it here, but in other places where the margins of life are much thinner, the rise in gas prices means life or death, okay? And that has created instability around the world in terms of rioting in the streets and people sort of who are generally disgruntled with how a situation might be. It's the tipping point that they need in order to not, you know, in order to be like, get out in the streets. So we're seeing stuff going on in Iran that maybe not, maybe would have not drawn people out to the streets because life is so difficult. And the other part of this gets back to that grain issue because people are also starving because food is expensive, right? Because energy costs are expensive, because it's all, it's related to inflation and it's coming on the backs of the COVID up and up, you know, I mean, there's, it's a perfect storm. And I heard an interview yesterday with an economist who said, I don't like to talk about perfect storms, but it's getting very windy. Mm -hmm. So I think there's just this maelstrom happening. I suspect, I don't want to say that Putin knew that that was, but I think he's, you know, I think people have said not to discount him as being crazy, but because that's, because he's not crazy, he might be maniacal. He might have wild ideas, but he's not crazy. Um, and then I think I'm gonna kind of leave it there and we can sort of like pick up threads of it um, where people still have questions, but it's all of that that goes into this billion, I don't even know if it's in the billions, it probably is in the billions at this point, but the amount of money and arms that are being sent. Okay, so let me just get one last thing. Who gets to decide what is a declaration of war? So we are giving a huge amount of armaments to the Ukrainians to fight their war against the Russians. So they're using American bullets and American guns to shoot Russians, and we're giving it to them. They're not buying it, right? So we did do a trick with the British during the Second World War in order to sort of say that we weren't actually giving it. Does anyone know what that was called? Lend lease. Lend lease. Where we said, no, 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 we're going to pay us back later. It's not, we're just lending it to them for now. Now, I don't even think we're doing that now. There's no like ruse. It's just like, no, we're just giving them a lot of stuff. So does that count as a declaration of war? If the Russians were in Mexico, no, excuse me, if Mexico was trying, if we invaded Mexico and the Mexicans were fighting out against us and the Russians were giving them 
millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars of armaments, would we feel like we were being attacked by Russia? Would that count as an exploration of war? It would feel like it, right? So, but no one wants that because then we actually have a hot war on Europe, on the continent of Europe between the United States and Russia. Ooh. Yeah. So the other thing I will tell you, I'll finish with this in terms of who gets to declare war. The US is also supplying intelligence to the Ukrainians about where Russian forces are, okay, using our satellites. The Russians have said, if any of that information is actionable, so if it can be acted upon and then used to kill Russians, that counts as a declaration of war. So apparently, there's a whole team of lawyers in Washington who are making sure that whatever intelligence is being given to the Ukrainians, the Russians don't think is actionable. And that scares me because I feel like that's a really gray area in terms of who gets to decide what's an act of war. So I'll leave it at that. But I think, I hope the takeaway to all of this is that this is really touch and go. That's scary. Yeah, I know. I think it's scary too. When it's a bunch of lawyers deciding who, what Putin is thinking, I, I feel scared. Okay, so I'm going to leave it at that for now. And I guess the plan was to kind of open it up to some Q and A, and hoping that some sort of like um, we'll sort of elucidate more things through that. Is that the plan? So we'll do a general discussion. Yeah, a general discussion. So uh, I guess we'll open it up to questions. Are there people who have questions? Okay, I got some hands. Okay. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so Crimea, just like being a part of Ukraine, like before it was annexed in 2014, like uh, from what I understood, there was a lot more Russian sentiment in that area, and then there was also like the success of Russian propaganda through the media. So, like, if Crimea at the time was still a part of Ukraine, why is it that? that section was able to be taken so much more easily versus like the rest of Ukraine. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to answer that? Sure. Okay. I, mean, I, yeah. I think I can. So what the, the question was. So why did, why did nobody do, why didn't anyone do anything when they invaded Crimea in 2014 versus now? Is, you, is Crimea any different than the rest of Ukraine? Well, okay, so if the closer you get to Russia, the more Russian speakers you have, right? And the more, the larger ethnic pop population you have that's closer to Russia. But what happened in 2014, right at the time that, so in 2014, the Ukrainians were very close to joining the European Union, which is this uh, economic bloc on the, of Western Europe. And the president of uh, Ukraine at that time was very pro-Russian, and he was born in this region over here. He was kind of Yanukovych or something like that. And um, when he rejected what most Ukrainians wanted to do, which was join the European Union, they had a what was called the, the Maidan Revolution. The Maidan's like the plaza, the plaza revolution, and they forced him out. That's when Putin decided to take Ukraine. Crimea. I mean, sorry, Crimea. Now, they had a vote in Ukraine, and 80% of the population wanted to join the European Union. This was a democratic vote that 80% of Ukrainians supported, and he decided he did not want to go along with that. And it was fairly easy for him to seize Crimea because the Ukrainians just did not, they didn't have the force to do it. They didn't have the, especially in 2014, they did not have the military power to stop him. And if, you guys might remember, you're, you're old enough to remember when they had the, um, one of the Winter Olympics was in Crimea right before, right before this happened, right? It was, um, uh, Sochi. So, yeah, Sochi, the Sochi Olympics were in, they were in Crimea. You know, right before this happened. And so um, it was pretty easy for him to do that. And there's not much that 
the United States or Britain or any other country could do about it at that time, right? Because, you know, the um, there wouldn't have been public support for it. You know, there just wasn't public support for it. To, and it would be too dangerous to go to war against Russia. It, most Americans, they just wouldn't say, well, why should we, they, they wouldn't see the reasoning in it. You know, they wouldn't see the reasoning in it. But the other thing to realize is that there are more Russians in this area, partly because when this, um, before World War II, when the Russians were trying to establish their dominance in the region, and the Ukrainians were rebelling against it, Stalin, who was the leader of the Soviet Union at that time in the late 1920s and the early 1930s, when the Ukrainians started to resist him, he sealed the borders of Ukraine and starved about five million people to death. And so these areas that have, you know, significant ethnic speaking Russian populations now, part of that is because the Ukrainians were starved to death and then they moved Russians into that region. So that's also important to remember. Then World War II happened and the Ukrainians died in the millions in World War II also. And it's ironic that Mr. Putin claims he's trying to liberate Ukraine from, not, from Nazis, you know, modern day Nazis, because one, the president of Ukraine is Jewish. And as far as I know, I've never met a Jewish person who was also a Nazi. <laughs> um, that would be an interesting, you know, considering the Holocaust and all. Uh, and then the other, um, uh, aspect of that is um, there's not really any Nazis in Ukraine. It's just something he says to try to justify what he's doing. In fact, the, the Ukrainians had their own version of the Holocaust. They call it the Holodomor. That means the time of famine, when millions of Ukrainians were starved to death. Now, despite that, millions of Ukrainians still fought against the Nazis. Some of them, there were groups of Ukrainian nationalists that fought both the German, the, not, the, the Nazi army of Germany and the, the Soviet army. Um, there were some that helped the Germans, but they were a, a, a minority. They were a tiny minority. Yeah. And so it's kind of relying on that history. Did that, did that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. I would just add also that, that the, when you think about the political, so I was just like looking up some dates. So 2014, Barack Obama was president. There's an important um, midterm elections going on where the Democrats lost a huge number of seats and everything went to the Republicans. So it's a politically demand. So when you think about when does the U.S. do things and when they don't, you have to take into consideration domestic issues. So it's already there's a, you know we know now elections presidential elections start at least two years prior to the next election cycle, right? So there's already this thinking of what can we do and get away, what can we do and what um, that, that will be tolerated by the American public that won't sacrifice our hold uh, on power. So there are ethnic, there, I, I think like in Odessa and places like that, so Odessa's here, but in parts of Crimea, there are people who identify ethnically as Russian, but I think more important than that is, has to do with the international will at that moment. And you know, the US, although we try, not, we try to not want to be that kind of same sort of like superpower leader, because I'm not sure that's a position we really a mantle we still want. There's not the political backing for that that there used to be in the midst of the Cold War. Um, we still do have that international obligation, or at least it has to be nuanced by like, let's get all the players in the room talking to each other, which is what we've done in this case. We've got Europe all on the same page. Um, but it's pretty remarkable that Biden was able to do that, and that his Secretary of State was able to do that. Um, so there was a hand here in the purple mask, yeah. Um, how do you think this will affect the relationship between Ukraine and Russia mm -hmm. after the Civil War? Mm -hmm. Someone has to die. <laughs> it's 
someone, where's Masat that needs to get out to the Let's just do it. Um, did you hear that question? Okay. What, what will be the aftermath? <laughs> uh, That's a good question. I don't, I mean, I guess my answer to, be, <laughs> to that would be, I mean, I really think, like, there's some people who at this point are pushing for some sort of a negotiated peace, and the Ukrainians are pretty firm on that never going, that they will never go to the negotiating table with Putin. Um, and it's, but it's possible that the United States, again, we have an election coming up here, right? So we don't know who's going to be president in two years or what have you. Is it two? All right. Yeah. And we, and things are dicey for the ruling party right now in terms of who's going to control the House and who's going to control the Senate, right? So things that might have gotten through now might not get through later. So the United States might have to twist the arm of the Ukrainians and say, we're not going to support you here. And then the people in power have to make the difficult decision if they're going to go to the negotiating table. I don't know if that's going to happen. You said, we should say no. So that would be my comment of like, I don't, it's going to be not pretty for a long time. I could, I could, well, one of the huge questions and one of the things that Mr. Putin wanted was a guarantee that Ukraine would not be allowed into NATO. He wanted a guarantee of that. He wanted a guarantee that Ukraine would not be allowed into the North Atlantic Treaty Organization because if you could zoom back out, Zoom, like, make, uh, do we see NATO? Come, come this Otherwise, way. Oh, come come this. Oh, wait. Oh, as much right. as I like that place where people live, I don't know. Not <laughs> is it a this one or where is it? If you could come, come make, make it the opposite. <laughs> yeah. I know, I don't speak. Russian or Ukrainian, so I don't help. Well, any of that, you can answer the question. Anyway, yeah. and so he wanted a guarantee, and nobody was willing to give him that guarantee. Now, so, and that's when he decided to invade. I think he decided before that. Well, I think he decided before that, but okay, you got to understand what you have to understand about Mr. Putin is he is a liar. He is a liar. You cannot trust anything. He says he is a liar. He kills his political enemies. Just three weeks ago, one of the uh, main executives in the Russian, the, the oil, the, the main Russian oil company, mysteriously fell out of a six-story window while at the hospital. It was an accident. It was an accident. And in the last few months, over eleven people who have criticized him have met with mysterious deaths. Um, either by gunshot, knife, suicide, or that poor man who decided to randomly jump out of a hospital window three weeks ago. Or poison. poison. He also has people poisoned. Um, his critics said of, uh, were living, some of his, he's poisoned in multiple people. Alexander Navalny, for example, is one of his main critics. He's been poisoned twice. Um, they like to poison people on planes because they know it's hard for them to get medical aid and they'll be dead by the time they get off the plane. And no cameras. And, and what? No, no cameras. cameras on the plane. And no cameras on the plane. And so he knows he can. So Navalny survived both poisoning attempts. They usually use like a radioactive material. And um, now he's in a prison in Russia. Still alive, but he's been poisoned twice. So that's what's going to happen if you criticize him. Um, he also, he, uh, the other thing that they've done, you have to understand, Russia is a dying country. They have, their population is dying off. They're aging. By 2050, or around between 2050 and 2060, Russia will have lost between 10 and 20 million in population. That is a dying country. You cannot grow the economy with that. You cannot remain dynamic with that. You're shrinking as a country. He knows that he cannot match the United States or Germany or France from an economic perspective, except through the sale. Russia has huge supplies of oil and natural gas. He does know that. But he knows that he cannot match the West 
and I'm using West, I sound like I'm back in the 1960s, you know, in the Cold War. He knows he cannot match, let's just say us, militarily. He knows he cannot match us economically. He knows his population is aging and dying, partly because 27 million of them were killed in World War II. Um, life expectancy in Russia is lower than it was in the communist period. So they're actually, they're dying at a slightly earlier age than they were before. Now part of that is just because they do stupid things, and like drink too much vodka and then pass out in the snow. Um, you know, you know. And, um, al alcoholism, if you think Americans drink, the Russians make us look like, you know, grannies going to church on Sunday. And it is a serious issue in Russian culture. He knows he cannot match us. But he, he does have a new thing that you guys have grown up with to wage information warfare. What is it? Your, your iPhones, the internet, your computers. And so they invested about three, you know, they invest, I'm sorry, I think they invested about $100 million in what they call the Internet Research Agency. What does the Internet Research Agency do? It's an arm of the Russian intelligence service that um, interferes, interfered in elections in the United States, in Great Britain, and in France in the last election cycles, and they will try to do it again. And so what they'll do is they'll take existing divisions within our society. You guys know we're a polarized society, right? And they'll, they'll use bots, they'll use uh, sham accounts to put out memes, that are inflam politically inflammatory memes that will foster even more discord within American culture. And he has the perfect weapon to do it. It's the internet. And all he has to do is take existing social media and then we do the rest for him. Or American networks do it for him. You know, some, there have been, there's some Americans news personalities who have basically been extensions of Putin's intelligence service without even thinking about it. And so that's a real problem. He knows he can't beat us that way, but he can influence us through information. And historically, Russia has always excelled at intelligence, at spycraft. They infiltrated our atomic program in the 1940s. They infiltrated the CIA. They infiltrated the State Department. They have uh, been very successful historically at infiltrating every level of American intelligence services. They're very good at it. They are, they're, they are extremely good at it historically. And so, for example, um, for some reason, both in China and in Russia, um, what the Americans call human intelligence, they've been getting arrested and disappearing. <laughs> It's not the first time it happened. It happened in the 1970s. Every agent working for the United States and Russia was actually in the 1980s, I think it was. Do you remember, Rich? Ames? 1980s? Basically, every one of our agents was outed, arrested, and, and killed. And so they are very good at it. And they have an advantage. Why? Because they live in a society where Mr. Putin controls all media. You have an advantage. If you can control all the news, you have an advantage. Because we live in a free society, we automatically operate at a disadvantage. And so then it becomes, do you want to, do you want to trade uh, your civil liberties to be on a more equal footing with somebody like that? My answer is no. Somehow, we always seem to win in the end, you know. Um, so, that's, a, a, that's like the so the answer to that question then is basically I I don't I don't oh, right. really need anyone answer the question. I'm like Rob, stay on topic. <laughs> um, no, because I think like the, you can see all this background, right? It exists, and um, so it's difficult to know what that will look like. But what what will happen? With, it, there's been a preliminary approval given to Ukraine to join NATO, mm -hmm. but you'll notice it's not moving forward. Why? Because that's a negotiating point. That's a negotiating point. If you can get the Ukrainians and the Russians to the table, 
that becomes a major playing card in those negotiations. If you can get, say, okay, we'll guarantee that Ukraine won't join NATO, but you have to withdraw from these occupied territories that you captured after April, February, and April of 2022. But that also presumes that the United States can tell Ukrainians what to do. And, yeah. and it's unclear, you know, they are their own people and they can, they can choose to walk away from the negotiations. And as long as the Ukrainians think they have a chance to win, they won't come in to negotiate. And it ties into something that actually happened today, which on the Twitterverse, so I'm reading the Twitterverse, um, there was two explosions that happened. There's these two pipelines that go, there are two oil, natural gas pipelines that go between um, Russia and Germany. They're called Nord Stream. There's Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2. And there were two bombings. I don't know if this can get bigger. It's kind of small. There were two um, attacks. This makes it, yeah, so there's, there's, well, you can try to make that bigger and I'll explain it. But there were two attacks on, on the two different um, pipelines today. And they were attacks that could only have been done by a sovereign nation. It's, um, they're deep water lines. They don't leak. And um, they, the explosions had the equivalent of like a 2.5 earthquake. So we know what earthquakes feel like here. And um, they happened very strategically. So I was trying, we were trying to find, there's another image I have, but essentially there's a line around this, that, this island and the pipeline goes into Denmark's, which is in, is Denmark part of NATO? Yes. Okay, so, it's tricky. Been there. Yeah. With NATO. Yeah, thank you. Um, so there's a, a line around this island and so within that line, is Denmark's proper, uh, you know, um, so sovereign lines, right? These are its borders. And the um, attacks happened just outside of that border in the water, in international water, but like within miles of it. And so there's all kinds of speculation now of who did this because it had to have been done. It's not like a- Not an accident. It's not an accident. And it's the kind of attack that takes enough um, wherewithal that it could only have been done by a, a, a country that has the ability to do that, which is either Russia or the United States. So there's, if it is that Russia is the person, is the place that bombed these two pipelines, there is speculation that this is Putin's final sort of like cutting off of Russia from Europe uh, as and that it is significant in the statement of what's going to happen because of course the other thing that happened today did anyone else know what's happened today in the occupied territories of Ukraine referendum there was a referendum okay so I know that my high school students are probably always on social media, so stop watching the corn song, which is what my daughter is watching all the time. <laughs> <laughs> my husband's here, he's gonna laugh. And you all laugh. Everyone else who doesn't know about the corn song, look at this very cute kid singing the corn song. So stop watching memes about the little kid singing the corn song. And start looking at uh, the fact that there was a referendum today in uh, these occupied areas of Ukraine as a sort of a fake, a staged, uh, voting at gunpoint, yeah. um, literally. So if someone came to your house and took your mother and said, I have my weapon pointed at you, go vote for this person, I think likely the mother would choose to vote for whoever that person said she needed to vote for. So there was a referendum about whether or not they wanted to become part of Russia. Okay, so can we switch back over to that other picture? So that... <laughs> So these were the, it's, it's this area here that had a referendum. Is it, is it that whole swath? And here it's near Kherson. Anyway, shocking. It was a landslide victory for the Russians that they want to join Russia, okay? Now, there's a lot of speculation about why is Putin doing this? This is an old tactic. The Portuguese did it when they wanted to join the UN. If you declare your colonies or the places you're occupying as part 
of your nation, then anyone who invades that is declaring war on you because actually Russia hasn't declared war. It's a special operation. So this is semantics. Those of you who want to go be lawyers or want to go work at the UN or want to work in government, it's all about what you call it or don't call it. Okay, so this is not a war. They have not declared war. They have not invaded Ukraine because those words have laws and behind them. And Russia does hold a seat on the Security Council at the UN and in theory has signed all of those treaties saying that they're gonna do certain things or not do other things. And so if they were actually to have declared war on Ukraine, as opposed to having a special operation, that would be different. Now, we ourselves as the United States have also used this language, so look at Iraq and Afghanistan and see if we declared war on Iraq and Afghanistan. The answer is no, we did not declare war on them. Because that would have meant a whole bunch of other stuff, even though we were in these places. For so if you ask the Iraqis and the Afghanis if we declared war We haven't on declared them. war since World War II. Yes. That was the last time we actually declared war. Is the president can't declare war. Congress. Congress has to declare war. So that gets tricky. Anyways, okay, some more questions. I have one and then <laughs> we'll give Ken some. Okay, so I'll do one. Let's start with you. Okay. You don't need your own thing. That's <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, I was listening to all this stuff, and uh, one of the things I tried doing was connecting at the parallels and other things I've learned about from both of you and, and other classes. But uh, one of the things I, I was curious about was, okay, so this is where I'm speaking from. So, uh, you know, and, uh, I remember when the Kingdom of Hawaii was uh, overtaken or overthrown by the U.S. in 1893, I thought it's kind of strange because Hawaii was recognized as a sovereign state. And they realized, no, it's not unusual that it, but it fell because, or it was overthrown because it was part of a trend of colonialism. Uh, you know, in the 1910s, I think there was a series of revolutions in Russia, China, and uh, in Mexico that all led to certain reforms in those countries. So I guess my question to both of you here is, do you think that the war in Ukraine is part of a larger trend that might be similar to those? And if so, what, what kind of trend would you call it? Well, OK, so if the trend, the trend before Putin invaded was probably the trend, which is sort of like a move in Eastern Europe and former Soviet states towards leaning towards the West, towards the EU and NATO and these other. So that might have been the trend. I, I think what we're trying to make sure of is that Putin's invasion of Ukraine is not the trend. So we will stop the trend before it begins. So that would be my answer to that. I think that's, that's what I would have said. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna let the man in charge have a question. So, oh, here we go. <laughs> Thank you, uh, I spent a lot of talk about nuclear weapons uh, in recent days. If that were to happen, would Putin or Russian military uh, uh, bomb uh, troops on the on the front line, or would they bomb Kiev? Yeah. You mean if, with the, if they used tactical, nuclear, tactical, what, what, tactical yeah. nuclear weapons? Okay, so this is my comment because there's always threats of nuclear weapons. There are a lot of really nasty weapons that do really nasty things way before you get to nuclear weapons that are already being used. Or smaller arms. I feel like you're going to have an answer to this too. This is Richard. This is our like, he's like in heaven. You know, here, but we're going to keep him front end. There are other smaller nuclear arms that are already being used. So if we're talking about like nuking a place in the traditional sort of like the way we think of like Hiroshima or something like that, I would argue that I don't think you'll see that, but you'll see some really nasty things being done that are already being used and, and arms and guns and, and, and missiles that are already banned by the international community that were not that are not supposed to be being used either against civilians or in combat, and they are being used a lot and readily by the Russians and frankly actually by the Ukrainians as well. So that would be my answer that we're already there. And we actually don't have to get to Hiroshima because there's some really nasty stuff that's already been there. What do you think? I don't know. Yeah, I he might use okay, so they've been the Americans have were secretly warning the Russians through back through kind of unofficially like 
If you use these weapons, there will be severe repercussions. Now, we haven't said what those repercussions would be. It probably depends on what they use. It seems pretty clear that in Syria, for example, um, Syria is closely aligned with Putin's regime, the Syrian regime. They were using chemical weapons. Uh, they were using Russian, using Russian advisors to use chemical weapons against civilians, which um, paralyzes the nervous system and you die. Right? You start to foam in the mouth and shake uncontrollably and fall on the floor and then you die. There's a possibility they could use small nuclear weapons that would affect a small area. So what's your response then? I don't think he would use like, I don't think he would nuke the city of Kiev, for example, because that would almost, I mean, we both have thousands of strategic nuclear weapons. It would basically mean the life, the end of life as you know it. Yeah, and that's why I was saying like, he's not crazy. But he's maniacal. He is, he is, and he's evil. He's, he is right? rational. But he's rational. He's rational. I would argue that. And ruthless. He's extremely intelligent. You guys got to understand, he is extremely intelligent. He fooled President Bush. He fooled President Obama. He fooled, you know, um, Trump. He fooled them all. He is extremely ruthless. I think what you would see if he used a t tactical nuclear weapon is NATO which really means us <laughs> uh, to a significant extent, I think you would see immediate NATO airstrikes on Russian positions in Ukraine. And you would see the Ukrainians getting the kind of, there's certain weapons we won't give them because we believe it'll escalate the situation. And by what weapons do we mean? Um, uh, more advanced missile systems and main battle tanks. Because if they have main battle tanks, they can overrun the Russians like it's World War II. But I, it, this is so dangerous, man. And now to go back to what Dr. Burlingham said, that the referendum they had the last two days, that's a sham. It's gonna, I promise you, it's gonna have like 97% approval rate, which is imp it's impossible. It's, it's statistically impossible. But by legally declaring that those sections, those areas are now Russian territory, what you were saying, he can go, oh, you're attacking Russia, therefore we can respond with as much force as we want. Yeah, because it's then it's the Ukrainians who are declaring war on the Russians by invading Russian territory, and so the Russians are really responding defensively. Despite the fact that they just captured that territory since in the last six months. And there's not really anything we can do to stop it. I think there's been a few more. Yeah. Actually, uh, I don't, I don't know who, uh, actually, you have, I got a quick question. Yeah. I have a quick question for you. I'll, I'll be loud. Okay. Hey, uh, I'll give a quick shout out to Cal State Fullerton history. I got my master's degree in history from there a few years back. Oh, yeah. 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 Teacher in Whittier, and I'm really impressed by how many high school teachers, high school students are out here tonight. So uh, give yourselves a round. Of applause. Uh, my question was, uh, it seems like a no-win situation, and uh, I was talking to uh, actually a colleague of yours uh, recently in more of a collegial friendly conversation, who said there's no there's no win for Putin here. Do you think that there is a possibility that he could, through a process kind of like Americanized or Vietnamization in Vietnam, like declare victory, turn over power to these uh, rogue states here, Donetsk and uh, Crimea, and then leave? And then if they fall, then it's not on him, and he could have clean hands. Is that a possibility, or is there any wiggle room for him to get out of this? So I would argue, and I think the thing that makes Putin an interesting character is that there's a whole, we didn't even talk about this, so you can go home and listen to some interviews. He had, there's like a whole myth, like mystical aspect to what he is doing, and he thinks basically he's like the second coming of Christ. I mean, and I mean that truthfully. And that, and, and, and so there is kind of like a cultish aspect to his rationale. So, it makes that, so he might not be irrational, but his rationality is 
skewed, like we're not all existing in the same reality. And there's been a lot of talk about how he's very, very isolated in terms of like the information he receives and the people who he talks to. And so, you know, I, I agree that this feels like there's no solution. Like either this can blow up or it can just kind of simmer for a really long time. I suspect at some point, maybe as we get closer to our own election, or, I mean, I think he's hoping as people freeze in Germany over the winter, and Britain, sorry, I didn't take the word, that there will be a groundswell to like figure this out if he's going to take that, give it to him, because this is done. And again, stability, we talked about stability, like global stability, global food prices continue to escalate. Interest rates in the United States continue to climb, which raises the dollar internationally. This is going to get very boring for you guys, but take a macroeconomics class. Uh, as the dollar rises, all of the sovereign debt that people have taken out internationally that's in dollars, they can't pay back with their own currency because if your currency used to get you $1, now it gets you $0.50. Cents. So you have the decline of those. So anyways, I, I I, I don't know. But anyways, I think it gets more and more complicated and not less complicated. You gotta, if, if it gets too costly, you got to give him a way out, though. You got to give him a way to, out of this where, where he can save face and declare domestic political victory. I keep waiting for somebody to just cap it. Yeah, in Russia. That's what I'm saying, where's Masai? We just need to bring in the Israelis. He won't let him get close in? enough, right? He's like, he, he goes to the bathroom with like six security guards. <laughs> You know, it's like he's, you know, obviously he's insecure because he's afraid somebody's going to kill him. He's like Stalin in World War Two. I think we had some, we, uh, why don't we go here and here and then cross cross over? I can, uh, what, you and, and then we'll go, go there. And... Okay, um, well, I think this is a really high, like obviously um, a very unrealistic hypothetical. But let's say that our like foreign dynamics with other countries were the same as the status quo. Do you think like but um, not bound by contract? Do you think that without the creation of NATO and the EU, that these conflicts with Crimea and Ukraine would ever occur to begin with? That's a great question because really some question. some people say right that. Yeah, I mean, some people say that. I mean, we gave assurances to the Russians before Putin that we would that NATO would disappear. I mean, there were high level agreement. I mean, you know, a handshake and, and, and not nothing written in stone, but that NATO was gonna go away and that, or if it didn't go away, we would never get this close to the Russians. We'd Russia. never get this close, yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, it's possible. But I think the thing is, is that I think we're all, you guys are all taught that the Cold War ended in 1989 when the Berlin Wall, fall, Berlin Wall fell and then like, hallelujah, the Cold War is over, okay? But I think the reality is, is that, hmm, that the Cold War is really hard to dismantle. And so I think there's an argument to be made and people have that this is actually just the continuation of the Cold War and not that the Cold War actually ended in 1989. Yeah, and- Mr. Putin makes that, he'll say, well, if you guys hadn't put all these countries in NATO, like Poland, Slovakia, you know, up to the north, there's three other countries that were in the Soviet Union that have been admitted to the EU and or NATO. And he's like, well, you boxed us in. But, but, uh, and the other thing that happened was when everybody thought Russia was just going to become like another democratic state in Europe, and it didn't. They tried it, and then within 10 years, Mr. Putin took over. 12 years. Within 12 years, Mr. Putin took over. It never became that democratic state. Thanks to, in no small part, thanks to the policies that we had in terms of bankrupting the country and the, the, the ruble. Yeah. The yeah. One, yeah, yeah. The, we think inflation is bad here. I think Russian inflation in the early 90s was like 300%. It was, it was brutal. The other thing is, though, those countries that were either next to Russia or countries that had been in the Soviet Union, they desperately wanted to be in NATO. They desperately wanted to be in the EU. So I would say on the other hand, 
they had really good historical reason to want to do that, and we're seeing why now. Yeah. And so when Putin says that, my my you know my critique is, well, you guys gave them a pretty good reason to want to be in NATO and to want to be in the European Union, and um, you know he showed well. I can see where a traditional Russian, though, thinking of like Russian interest would be like they're boxing us in. Mm -hmm. They're boxing us in. And that there's there's probably no good answer on that. Well, I would, just, I, I would say in like this is what people have said in response to that very question is that if you were to say that the NATO boxed in Russia, it discounts the um, agency of the people in these Eastern European countries who chose to do that. So it's not like the U.S. went in, or France or Britain went in and said, you're joining NATO or we're invading. That is the choice of these people. And so if you take them out of the scenario, it, it dehumanizes them and it takes away their autonomy. So right, and that was what the, Ukra the Ukrainians were like, no, we're, a, we're an independent country. You can't tell us whether or not we can join NATO. You can't tell us whether we can join the EU. And historically, if you're a Ukrainian, you know that you know, three to five million Ukrainians were starved in the 1930s because your grandmother told you stories. You have a good reason to want to be in NATO. If you were in the North, in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, you were forcibly incorporated into the Soviet Union. People were arrested and sent to gulags. If you were in Poland, you were forcibly incorporated into the West Eastern Bloc. Now, you know, we're not, we're not always angels either. I, I do want to say that, but, you know, in international law, if you are an independent and sovereign country, you get to choose who you associate with. But were I in the position of a traditional Russian, I probably would feel the same way that he did, but it's still, it's, a, it's still a power move. It's still an assertion of the Russian empire whether it's the current Russia, the Russia of, commun of the communist and the Soviet Union, or the Russia of the czars going back to Catherine the Great. You know, they keep doing the same. Their goals are basically the same. Extend to the south, you know, create a Russian empire, whether they're communists, you know, the czars of Anastasia, you know, like Anastasia died, by the way, just like the cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, she's dead. She was dead. I promise. Uh, or the or the current right now they're basically run by an oligarchy of extremely rich people. Yeah. And so they've always had the same goals, whether it's the 1700s, the 1800s, the 1900s, or the 2000s. But they definitely, if we had, well, let me put it in, regardless of if they were in NATO or the EU or not, I think he would be doing the same thing. And when you become a history major at Cal State Fullerton, you'll understand that we don't do hypotheticals in history. Yeah, this is. <laughs> <laughs> if no one wants to repeat of another world war, why is Russia like flying to Poland, like NATO territory airspace, or bombing really close to the Poland Ukraine border? Why is he willing to do that and sort of not directly like affect NATO, but like sort of like egg them on a little? It's a warning. It's a, it's a warning. It's a warning. And he, that's a great question. And it, we used to do this with the Russians too, where they would like fly off the coast of Alaska and the Russian bombers would see how far they could come into a United States airspace before American fighter planes, you know, intercepted them. And then they would escort the Russian bombers out. There's always been this cat, cat and mouse, you know, it's a cat and mouse game, but he's trying to, they're also probably testing to see how they'll react. like. How far can we how, how far can we violate airspace before they know we're there? Because they're probably they're, they may be trying to figure out if there's American um, anti-aircraft missiles in the re, in the area as well. So it's um, there's a there's a little there's a there's a little you know it gets a little provocative. Yeah. Other, Thank you. other questions? I saw some hands in the back. So let's say one and then two. Go ahead. We might have to like call it. Yeah, we'll do that. So undoubtedly, this war will change all of Europe. But to what extent do you think it'll affect like the economy or even political relations 
20, 30. I'm sorry, could you, could you repeat that? You're absolutely repeated to me. How much do you think that will affect Europe 20, 30, maybe even 50 years in the future? So the question is, um, it's, it, it's, it has changed European relations and global relations. And how, how will this affect things 20, 30, or 40 years in the future? I would say I have no idea. I mean, I think so much could happen. We don't even know who's going to be president in two years. And that could radically change our approach to dealing with this. If we were to get a president in power who is very pro-Russia and who basically stopped all armament shipments to Ukraine, uh, that would radically change what's going on here. So I was, my answer to that would be that it's, it's impossible to know what that is. As we also say, like, did anyone see the COVID-19 pandemic coming? Like, some people warned that, that was going to happen, but I don't, even when your school shut down, I mean, when my kids' school shut down, I was like, okay, uh, see you in a month, maybe? And then, like, we'll get this thing together, right? So we just don't know, because 20, 30, 40 years is, is hard to think about. But I do think that there might be, my, my prediction is that when we look at this, like, in the grand scope of history that this will feel more like a continuation of the Cold War and that we no longer think of it ending in 1989, but this just kind of shifting, pivoting. It was a break. Yeah, a break. It was, a break. It was a sort of a break, but not, not entirely. OK. Yeah. Uh, thank you both for your time tonight. This was a very good, um, insightful talk. Um, Forgive me if this question feels a little bit longer, but I know that a lot of uh, kind of veteran American diplomats in the 90s, such as George Kennan, who uh, constructed the containment policy during World War II, suggested that uh, treating Russia, continuing to treat Russia as an enemy after the Soviet Union dissolved and communism uh, collapsed, um, as you kind of indicated with our economic policies towards them and expanding NATO and allowing NATO to be expanded in the 90s and onward um, would have negative repercussions and come back to bite us. So um, Dr. Burlingham talked a lot about kind of interests and the United States acting in their own interest. What was our interest in expanding NATO and um, acting with hostility towards Russia in the 90s? Uh, or what was the rationale behind that policy? Uh, I think it's I, I think it's several things, and I'll just list some, and I'm probably going to forget half of them. But keeping in mind that NATO is a military alliance, and also that Russia, even though um, it's not technically the Soviet Union, is still seen as a threat because even though it you know do you know if we have all these like bullet um, strategic arm limit, limitation treaties um, to try and get rid of nuclear weapons and other kinds of intercontinental ballistic missiles and all of that kind of stuff. Um, it's still seen as belligerent, and, the, and that relationship is, is never like cozy. And so I think if we had dismantled, my feeling is, is that if we had, dis, that NATO was never going to be dismantled because you don't give up strategic military partnerships that easily if you're not totally convinced that the person or the, the place is exactly what it claims to be. Um, and, and Russia, although sort of like castrated in the sense of not being what it could have been a challenge to us, it's still a threat. Um, Although there's also, and then I would also argue, uh, you know, when the Cold War ends, there's this moment, this is when I was like your guys' age in the 90s, where we're, they call it, you know, there's these essays written about like, the end of history, like that capitalism and the end of religion will reign supreme and everything's already happened and we won the war and it's done, so we're not going to give up anything. So I can't, that would have been a big, give back that I don't think would have been realistic or strategically. Um, you had asked another part of that question, and now I can't remember. Did I answer that sort of? I mean, I mean, I think the Russians are asking, too, why did you keep this? But I think the thing is, it's not like, I think 
Oh, I, oh, I was going to say another thing about Ukraine. So that part of this story is also that the Ukrainians did give up their nuclear weapons. So most of Russia's nuclear weapons were housed in Ukraine during the Cold War. And one of the important advances that happened is that the Ukrainians agreed to give up all of their nuclear weapons. If we guaranteed their security. If we guaranteed their security. They should have kept them. They should have kept some. On the side. Yeah, on the side. <laughs> Uh, and so, because if they had, it's likely we, you know, things would be different. Um, but I don't, yeah, I guess my answer would be like, when the Cold War ends, this is why I think when we look back at this moment, we're not going to think of the Cold War ending in 1989, because it didn't really end. Things changed. It took a turn. Russia was never truly democratic. It's been a kleptocracy, basically, since the Cold War, you know, since the the Communist Party government fell. Um, but I, I, I don't know, come back in 20 years when you guys finish your PhDs, because that's how I think it's going. Um, and, you, and let's have that conversation, because I, my prediction is that the, the answer to that will be because the Cold War hadn't actually ended. But I don't know, maybe. Prove me wrong. I think we have one, one, one more, one more. Sure, one more. You were, you were very patient. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so earlier on, we talked about like the amount of Russian people leaving, especially when they had like the order of um, the like military con conscription. Um, what did Putin think about those people? Like, did he see them as like Ukrainian sympathizers, or did he? Even well, it's yeah. still happening, right? So it's not in the past. Right? What, is, no, what does he mean? They're not. They're not good Russians. They're not good Russians, and, and they're stalking them at the border. They're what? Yeah, they're, 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 they're actually so drafting some of them at the border. At the border. Yeah. That were for trying to cross into Georgia the last few days. As soon as they hit the border, they're like, here are your papers. Now they were also only supposed to um, recruit people who had prior military service, and it turns out they were drafting everybody. And um, in some cases, they were drafting people with severe health problems. Now, the other thing they've been doing is um, going into prisons and offering people to, they'll let them out of prison if they go to Ukraine. Um, and then offering big cash bonuses to other people to, to, to enlist. The only problem is they're not, they're only training them for two weeks Putin is victimizing another group of people. He's victimizing his own, these people that he's conscripting, because he's going to send them to fight against the Ukrainians who will be much better trained than they are, and the Ukrainians are going to slaughter them. The Ukrainians are absolutely going to slaughter them. And so... Uh, I would also add to that um, that Russian youth are not all that different from you guys, right? So for like younger folks here or any of us, that in terms of you pay attention, you guys are obviously like very studious and you're here and you're listening and you're, you're participating, uh, but you have a life and you're plugged into things and you're probably not like actively following people in Syria or in, in Afghanistan and other places because you have other concerns. And so things can feel distant. And even though the Russian economy is very much influenced by those things, Things get real when there's a draft, right? So all of a sudden you start paying attention and you think, oh hell, I'm really interested in my YouTube channel and making money off of right. that and I am not going to fight in this war, but I'm not gonna have a choice, okay? And so that's why when Dr. McLean said, for those of you who are like approaching conscription age, 18, um, you know, God forbid we get to that point, but like all of a sudden, uh, the other things in your life that seemed more important uh, are not going to seem that important. So you have a lot of people who are just regular folk like you who are going about their lives and who this felt distant and didn't concern them because it was people who were military trained. Maybe you're touched by people in the military. You have an uncle or a brother who's in the military. But you know, this is not unlike you know, how much of your everyday lived experience before we pulled out of Afghanistan did you feel the Afghan war? The Afghan war was your entire lives. 20 years. For your entire life, the United States has been at war. Did you feel that? 
So if we had had a draft, that might have been different, okay? So I think, like, we need to think of these people as just regular folk also, that things get real when there's draft. They, they listen to the same music you do. They're great kids. I had a lot of Russian friends in graduate school. We had a blast. They are, they are wonderful. And they happen to have the misfortune of living in a system that is extremely, well, they get, you can kind of, as long as you mind your own business and don't criticize, you can, you're okay, right? But what they were doing, um, they had so many men killed and wounded that they had to call up 300,000 people because before this, most of the, overwhelmingly, the Russians that have been killed and wounded come from extreme, like from Siberia. And they come from the very poorest part of Russia. Uh, Putin did not want to, he did not want to recruit soldiers from Moscow. He did not want to recruit soldiers from St. Petersburg because he knew the public would get upset. And now he's had to announce 300,000. And I promise you, by next summer, enough of them will have been killed or wounded that he's going to announce more. And that's when it's that's when you might see some real unrest in Russia because this is this will not most Russians have gone along as Dr. Burlingham has said because it hasn't really touched them directly, you know. But when you have to start recruiting kind of like middle class Russian kids instead of prisoners, instead of people from the equivalent of the Russian Appalachians. Um, then it becomes a very different war. But if I have to guess what's going to happen in the spring when the fighting starts again, these 300,000 soldiers that get drafted, they are going to get, make no mistake, they're killing a lot of Ukrainians. The Ukrainians are taking very heavy losses. But the Russians, they're inflicting casualties at a higher rate on the Russians. And those 300,000, they are going to be chewed up in about, a, within a three-month period, they will be gone. They'll be gone because in the six month period that we just went through, they, the Ukrainians have killed or wounded probably 80 to 100,000 Russians. That's a lot of people. They're going to kill those guys fast. And Putin's going to have to call up more. Then we'll see what happens if he can stay in power. And if the body bags start coming. And when the body bags start. Well, so they, the Russians bring. Uh, crematorium trucks and they burn the bodies on site so they don't have to bring the body bags back. Where's my get, son? Where's my yeah, son? Where's my son? son? Right, right. Where's and we have son? precedent of this. Like, places like Argentina where like the mother's movement of like, I want to figure out what you do with my son. And then, you know, moms can be, you know, they can be something to be reckoned with. So like, yeah, it's a question about when those questions start to be uh, asked. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so it, it's going to just become a matter of the last thing I'll say is there's a lot more Russians and Ukrainians. He's betting that they can they can grind the Ukrainians down. I don't think they can because the Ukrainians are much the Ukrainians are willing to take huge losses to defend Ukraine. They are willing to take huge losses because they're motivated. The Russian soldiers probably 90% of them are not motivated, and the Ukrainians are gonna punish them. In this. The Ukrainians are gonna suffer a great deal. A lot of innocent people are gonna to die too, but the Ukrainians are going to punish them in the spring. When the roads dry, when the weather clears after the thaw, and the fighting, this is the traditional fighting season in Russia. Just as in World War II, they're fighting in the same towns, they're fighting along the same roads, and um, I think they're gonna, I think they're going to, Russia is going to have to start drafting everybody or a large number of people, and it's going to be extremely unpopular. That's just my, that's my prediction. Yeah, I don't, I don't disagree. Time will tell. I think there's so much, yeah. Thank you.